Hey, Ryan, how are you? Tim, how are you? Good. So you, you go to Berkeley. Uh, what, did you, what did you major in? I, I went in as a mechanical engineer and left as an industrial engineer. I realized I enjoyed math more than physics. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but also the world of industrial engineering was closer to product management and design and computer science. And, and so I um, uh, ended up while at college working at a small company at the time called salesforce.com and uh, didn't know what they did, uh, but got this incredible internship that turned into kind of working through the school year. But the funny part about that story is in my head, I was taught kind of growing up, like you want to work for a big company, not a small one. And so- Well, seeing his dad worked for a rather big enterprise called the US Navy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so uh, on graduation, I went and worked at Microsoft because I really wanted to learn what it looked like to work in a large organization and end up working for the Office for Mac team. You very quickly, you know, as you get older and you see how things work, you go, oh, wait a second here. That startup there was doing something quite incredible. And I think the Berkeley today actually orients more of its students around the startup ecosystem that's in the Bay Area. But this was, yeah. you know, 06, 07 when it was just different then. Um, but I, I loved my time at Microsoft. I learned so much. I, I, I think you need to spend time in small companies and large ones to be, I think, an effective leader because you then understand the nuances and what you can change and what it looks like when you're a fast moving ship or a large one, like yeah. the US federal government. If you don't work in a small company and you do only work in large companies, you don't know what you don't know. I remember years ago, uh, Ryan interviewing a nice man, early 50s, I had worked for 30 years at a very big company in Manhattan. Uh, Seagram's was the company. He said to me, I'm really entrepreneurial. And I thought, oh, how sad. You know, he, he just doesn't know. He's saying it and he really believes it, but he just doesn't know. You know, so when at that time uh, at Flowers, a much smaller company, I, I said, what happens when you call uh, tech support at your company? He says, well, you know, they come running down to the office because I'm a big cheese and uh, they take care of everything. I said, here, we'll hand you a screwdriver. <laughs> You've got to do it yourself, yeah. yeah and and that, it, it, like you say, if you haven't worked in a small and then haven't worked in a big, it's difficult to to have the perspective that you need to understand how different things work differently. Completely, there are different. There's a different entrepreneurial muscle at a large organization to try change it, yep. and a very different one when you're on your own, building a company from scratch, and they are not the same. We talked about an in-between ground there. So trying to do something entrepreneurial in a large company is very, very different than trying to do something entrepreneurial out on your own. The biggest difference there is when you do something entrepreneurial in a large company, you're trying to take the you're trying to change the status quo of a large yes. organization. They're making money in this existing way. And everybody around is trying to reject the tissue. <laughs> of course. And so if you're successful at it, that's a different kind of politique, right? Like you've got to show, you've got to demonstrate, you've got to get a lot of political buy-in. But even if you succeed at it, it doesn't mean the organization is still going to accept it, right? And so there is that risk there. Yeah, um, yeah. But talking about risk, though, if you fail at an entrepreneurial venture at a large company, you can always find and move on to the next thing. I think when you fail at a, you know, at your own venture, yes, you can move on to the next thing, but it's a different kind of failure. You don't have that backstop, very different kind of scar tissue, very different lessons learned. I think you probably embody them more. Uh, that tissue is a lot more cut deeper when it's um, your own venture. Yeah. So uh, you had this great experience at Microsoft and I uh, marvel at Microsoft being as large as they are. I, I had a conversation like this uh, last month with a mutual friend of ours, Lucas Jopa. Oh, wonderful. And to he, and I, uh, I've only gotten to know him since uh, I met him at our, our, our Worth uh, Climate event last March in Mountain View that you spoke at. And I met him there and he just made such an impression on me. First of all, he's such a nice guy, such a smart guy and the different crazy things that he's done. But he speaks with reverence about his experience at Microsoft and the opportunities he had. And so I, as you do, and I hear uh, so many good things about how they're able to maintain such, let's call it the largest company in the world, at least from a market uh, value point of view, one of the largest certainly, 
uh, that they're able to maintain with so many people that entrepreneurial spirit in, in so many quarters of the company. You know, Lucas and his team there, they're trailblazers on the um, uh, carbon removal side, on the environmental sustainability work that they do, you know, zooming out to the company as a whole. I, I think Microsoft stays competitive because the talent there, Jim, are continually hungry. Uh, just down the street, there's the largest, you know, Amazon is, is just around the corner. Uh, they've got a culture of trying multiple approaches and competing sometimes internally to, to get yep. things done. There's a culture of trying new things, embracing new things. You can see that in what Satya has been able to do this past decade as, as a leader at the company. Um, it's a very different Microsoft now, I would say, even in, in a good way. It's much more open. You know, when Microsoft builds things today, it builds it from multiple platforms and multiple places. When I was there on the Office for Mac team, it was kind of a really good thing in the corner. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, I think the Office team is actually much more unified. I hope you forgive me and I hope our listeners forgive me because but you touched on Satya and I, I wanted to finish up with a question about him, but we're there, so I'll go now. I was uh, blown away by Lucas's uh, high regard and uh, and reverence for Satya and what he's done there, what he did before and now what he's doing as CEO. Do you know him? Satya personally? Yeah, I do not. I do not. I've I, I did talk to him once when I was uh, a first year out of college in, at Microsoft, um, yeah. and was wildly impressed with his just clarity of thinking. I just passed around yesterday an interview he did where he made a really uh, in, the, in so many things he said there were uh, cogent and spot on with his uh, clear thinking on the assessment of the state of technology, the economy, and the tech economy right now. And one thing he said that's ringing in my head is he said, uh, there is not a downturn in the hiring of tech people. Yes, tech companies are laying people off, but net net, they're hiring more tech yeah. people. They're not letting their tech people go. I think, I'm sorry, he is accurate. I mean, when you look across the different kinds of layoffs that are happening in the tech industry, yes, they are larger than they've ever been, right? 5%, 10%. Yes. But the style and the way that the cuts are happening, Jim, it's um, reprioritizing groups. And so they'll cut a group. <laughs> the best people from those groups aren't leaving those companies. They're actually putting them on to different teams. Yep. Um, I think companies, though, are also then using this moment as in, in the world of performance management. There are people that are at these companies that haven't been performing, and they're using this moment to uh, maybe cut more than they normally would. And that's very mm -hmm. unfortunate, but these are also talented people that are finding jobs afterwards as well. That, that's the other part of it. Well, this is different than other recessions or recessionary kind of environments in the tech sector where you do see large uh, announcements of layoffs. The people who are being laid off are finding pretty quick opportunities, it seems to me. I, there was like, a, I think I saw that there was some data on it. It was like within... I think there's a good portion find another job within a month and then the vast majority within three to six months. I, I'm always a believer of sometimes when doors close, they, they can lead to better things, right? You know, in, you know, if it was a big company that did a layoff or a small company, maybe you're better at the alternative or a different yeah. kind of place, a different culture that embraces you and appreciates you for your, your talents, you know? Well, you, you've had, I guess, all three experiences in your career, uh, Ryan, in that you've had a big, the, the biggest company experiences, you've had startup experience uh, and everything in between. But then we let's talk about this unbelievable experience you had to be basically the CTO of the United States of America in the Obama White House. I assume you didn't succeed anybody there. Was it a new position? How did it come about? So I was the uh, deputy chief technology officer for the United States. And so I had the privilege of working for both Todd Park and Megan Smith, who were both the CTOs. Um, it was a new position created under the Obama administration to effectively, the first iteration of it was to, uh, how do you ensure that the U.S. stays competitive on technology? And so it was a policy kind of focus. When Todd came in, it was then... It, the role expanded to being, okay, keep the U.S. competitive, but how do we as a federal government stay competitive and build the best technology for people using our services, right? Like if you file your tax form or you get healthcare through healthcare.gov or something like that. And then when Megan Smith came in, it was really about entrepreneurship. How did you get there? How did, how did, oh, yeah. you, get, how did you get tapped? 
kind of in the most random and serendipitous ways. And so the company that I was working for, um, uh, Aquahired Mine, I was building a digital health company. You know, this is like when I said some doors closed for us, our future in building a big company around monitoring patients is what we were, we were doing post-discharge. We were there to help people when they got out of hospitals. This was right when the Affordable Care Act got passed. And we thought there would be a flow of money, Jim, coming in to fund these kinds of companies. And, and there weren't at the time. Now there's a lot more money in digital health, but not back in 2010, 11. And so we decided our best path was to get aqua hired. And so we did. We joined this amazing company called Ginger. I moved to Boston, was working for them for six months, helping them start their West Coast office. And they saw a tweet from Todd Park about a program called the Presidential Innovation Fellows. It was kind of mimicked after the White House Fellows Program, but a little different because it was about bringing, I would say, nerds into government to go work on problems in a more entrepreneurial way, right, to use that term. I never thought I would get it. I like clicked on the application and really filled it out with more of this energy of, well, okay, if you're going to work, one of the projects was working on healthcare uh, and helping unlock patient records. I'm like, if you're going to do that, try it this way, right? I built this small little company. We could have been more successful in helping people if this is how the world looked like. And they loved that application. I got a call, like a good whole set of days full of, you know, of interviews and then was asked the following day, will you come to DC next week? And so that was supposed to be a six month stint, Jim, as a innovation fellow in the Department of Health and Human Services. Those six months turned into a year. I then joined Todd Park's team as a senior advisor. That year then turned into a year and a half and two. Very quickly, this turned into a three and a half year experience in DC working at the White House. I became the deputy chief technology officer because of an experience. I, I think your listeners probably are very familiar with healthcare.gov, especially sure. back in 2013, right? This website was designed to help people understand if they could, um, if they're eligible to buy healthcare plans on the marketplace. And when it launched, it just didn't work, Jim. And I was part of this team that was there to turn it around, right? It was five or six people that then turned into a lot larger one working with incredible people within government, an incredible set of folks within the contractor ecosystem to, to re, you know, boot this project. We got a great shout out as a result of this on Saturday Night Live on the weekend update. The talent on the show that they said, oh, wow, uh, the uh, website failed. They said they didn't anticipate so much uh, traffic. That would be a little bit like uh, 1-800-Flowers saying, we forgot Valentine's Day. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's so true. You and your world, you deal with these spikes. We were happy for that failure because we got this amazing shot of there sitting there on a Saturday night watching this going, they just mentioned our name. <laughs> um, you know, this is, I mean, but it also proves as a great example of like when you build services in government, sometimes you only get one chance to build them, right? Yep. At the federal level, you build it once. And so there isn't this iterative thing or competitive thing. You at 1-800-Flowers, you get, you have competition at every layer of <laughs> local, yep. regional, state. And so your, you, your product is designed to perform well and meet what a consumer expects. And so I actually think there would have been, it would have been kind of amazing to have some folks on your team to be a part of this, this effort. Well, well, Frankly, uh, uh, you mentioned that your dad, uh, 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 you grew up a Navy brat. Uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, uh, deploy some of our people, maybe the wrong, words, uh, wrong choice of words to deploy, but lend some of our people to some efforts, for example, that the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Navy, the Secretary of Navy, asked some outside people to come in and look at their systems. And so what a treat for all people to be able to go and help their country, even in a small way like that. So. I, I think there is an effort and it has been since you uh, initiated it for uh, government people to be less insular and to say, hey, there's some knowledge out there that we don't have. Let's go tap into it because people out there are patriotic. They'll want to share their knowledge. Absolutely. And that was the biggest takeaway in the, the kind of the story of being the deputy CTO was healthcare.gov. It gets turned around. It's a longer story. It could take like two hours. The lesson from it was how do you get great technologists to be in government, to work alongside great policymakers, great doctors and lawyers and others 
to build it right from the first time, right? And so we ended up starting a group called the United States Digital Service. We um, grew the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. There was a great, another group called 18F created. It was this wave gym back in 20, I guess now 16, 15, 16, of people coming to serve, just like how your team went in to help. Part of these different experiences working as an entrepreneur, working in a large company, working in government, working now in venture capital, I really, it's been this search to really empathize with each of the different levers of how to tackle a problem. You know, it's very easy to say government doesn't know how to do things or nonprofit doesn't, or, you know, for-profit stuff does things best. And that's completely not true. We can all learn from one another, right? And if we actually come together, focus our attentions on the real, you know, the problems that matter, like good stuff can happen. And one of the things that uh, we learned in that rubbing up against uh, the uh, Navy Department, looking to bring in some outside uh, private industry uh, knowledge, like you like you alluded to here, the future of conflict, the future of uh, inter-country stress uh, is about supply chain, as we all just witnessed in Ukraine. Yes. And it's all about technology as we're seeing now in Ukraine with uh, drones, but logistics is the key. I think our potential enemies would like us to not be able to leave the port. The efforts yeah. of the government in terms of being able to get their people to the ships and their ships to sea, everyone talks about the number of uh, numbers and pieces of equipment in theater. But first you gotta get your supplies there and your people there and your technology secure so they can function as intended. And that's our vulnerability point that I think our enemies will be more and more focused on in the future, why your work was so essential. And you were controversial then, I remember, Ryan, because in government, you were using the word open source. We, we were using uh, the two words, open source and open data. You know, yep. uh, our feeling was if taxpayer dollars were used to fund a program, to fund the collection of data, whether it be on school test scores or satellite data tracking weather, you know, patterns, it should be made available to the American people and the public. President Obama was super supportive. He signed the open data executive order. Um, you know, the, the data.gov was created so people could go and find these data sets. One of the best things that happens when you open data, right, Jim, it's called like the sunshine effect, right? With transparency, good things can happen, right? And so there is a lot of open data transparency efforts in uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services around how much people were getting charged for healthcare procedures, right? And it you know led to all these reports and investigative pieces around. Oh my God, why does one place charge fifteen thousand, another fifty, and they're just a mile apart? The different different stages of efficacy. Exactly right. You um. So the, the kind of the the gems here were the data was already being collected. So all you had to do, all you had to do in quotes, it took a little effort, just put it online in a machine readable format and let the public use it. And if people start to use data sets and have added exactly, invest more in it. The culture continues today to to today, which is exciting. You know, the the, the, the on the open source side, I think it's because folks want to share the work that they're they're doing, right? Like um, one of the first health record systems was created by the Department of Veterans Affairs, right? And they built it and it's things like that should be made open source, right? Because it's taxpayer dollars working on something important to so share it with the world. And it's not only catching on, I think it's why you are seeing more people come in and work in government because- they come in, they do this work, Jim, and people get to see it. So you change the world. You have a wonderful uh, almost four-year experience in Washington, D.C. And then what happens next? Uh, so I was uh, living in D.C., but my wife was in California. So I was traveling far too much between the two, for between the two cities. So I always say that, you know, cities... Uh, if there are two cities that had a date, San Francisco and D.C., that's a good combo, right? San Francisco mm -hmm. wants to change the world. So does D.C. You know, if D.C. gets in too close with, you know, like a New York, it's a different kind of incentive or L.A. I don't know, more teasing than anything. Um, but I, I had to come back. And so I came back in 2015 and was really set on building another company. And so I had reached out to Mike Abbott, who was at Kleiner, a general partner there that uh, helped as part of the turnaround effort. Mm -hmm. And he said, Ryan, if you're going to build something, be an entrepreneur in residence here. Come here, spend time at Kleiner, tap into our network, see if what you want to build is what you want to build. Yeah. And so I moved back, Jim, with the mode of being a founder again. 
And, you know, as destiny be, uh, I, I was uh, working on a new thing for a good six months. And John Doerr, the chairman of Kleiner, was moving into that role. He went from managing partner to being the chairman of the organization. And he was looking for someone to work with, Jim. And his criteria was he was looking for someone that was an engineer that uh, had built a company before that had uh, maybe either government or healthcare experience or, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. The evolution of Kleiner's uh, climate investment was really big in 04, 05, 06, 07, right? Mm -hmm. Is when John mm -hmm. gave that incredible TED talk, yes. reoriented the fund to, I think, invest about a third of it into clean tech, and then a growth fund that was dedicated completely to clean tech. But you remember that bubble kind of burst in 08. And we yes. can talk more about how really it just took a lot more persistence and time because uh, there were many gems that came from that experience. But when I joined Kleiner 20, 15, 16, it was very much we were focused on consumer tech, enterprise tech, and hard tech with a digital health practice as well, too, kind of categorically the disruptive technologies in in the Valley. And so yeah. we were very much working and investing across that spectrum, not mm -hmm. climate at the time. And so we can talk about how that ramped up. Not what? Uh, not climate at the not time. Climate. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was deprioritized. What's your portfolio then when you start with John? Yeah. So in starting with John, it was very much focused on healthcare investments. It was focused on taking care of the companies that he was um, on the board of and still is on the board of many of them and was as well taking care of some of our climate investments, Jim. There had been ones made back in 05, 06, 07 that were still around and doing mm -hmm. quite well. I got a front row seat into the Clean Tech 1.0 wave movement catastrophe as well, right? What scar tissue came from it? What lessons could be learned around the time that John and I started working together? He had partnered up with Bill Gates and Vinod Kosla and John Arnold and a handful of others to create breakthrough energy ventures, right? These are the investors that a lot of scar tissue from 1.0 were like, well, yep. we've got to continue to invest because the climate crisis is real. We're emitting far too much. We need alternatives. Front row seat, Jim, climate clean tech was not in my bio, like bio or background or experiences, mm -hmm. but I got to see the company building side of it. I got to see the stresses of it. I got to see what the, you know, heroes looked like from the Lynn Jurics at Sunrun to the Ethan Browns from, from beyond, like the grit that it took, right. To build these kinds of companies. And then 2020 rolls around right before COVID we were trying to figure out how we were going to ramp up our climate clean tech investing and philanthropic work. Because as chairman, John is basically able to do a lot more out of his family office as well, right? He's yeah. Kleiner first, I'm Kleiner first as well. But this let us explore more into clean tech. Mm -hmm. And John posed this question of, well, Ryan, what would it look like if we applied OKRs to the climate crisis? So the, the, the two important ingredients you just uh, introduced there. Were you uh, uh, familiar with the OKR concept before you joined uh, John and Kleiner? Uh, how did that education evolution take place for you? Yeah, I was introduced to OKRs, believe it or not, Jim, uh, working on the healthcare.gov rescue. Mm -hmm. Mikey Dickerson was one of the rescue team members, and he came from Google. <clears throat> and we were in this, you know, war room situation room like environment, 20 different contractor organizations, six different folks from government, and we're all throwing out what the problems look like, what measures we needed to tackle. And Mikey so beautifully, brilliantly, concisely wrote on the board. Uh, effectively, we are going to fix healthcare.gov for the vast majority of people. And then he wrote these measures down there. He's like, we've got to get seven out of 10 people through that are applying. We need a one second response time, a 1% error rate and 99% uptime. While that all looks pretty good for someone who's, you know, if anyone's listening, that's running a company right now, they're like, well, duh, those, that looks pretty good uh, or normal, <laughs> I would say, or maybe not even good enough. It should be better than that. At the time, the website was at 48% uptime, Jim. So it was down half the day. Yeah. Uh, the error rates were in the 12%, the one per second, you know, response times were actually like 30 seconds to two minutes. And 
no one could apply. Like I think out of the couple of hundred thousand people that applied on the first day, six people got through. I have no clue how they got through, Jim, but they got through. <laughs> um, and so we had a lot of work to do, but this OKR provided a North Star for us. It allowed us to say yes to things, no to things, reprioritize things, and was the clarity that we needed. And from that experience, I think I, I learned to value how important they were in a very cr in a crisis moment. And spending time with John, actually helping him write his first book, Measure What Matters, I got to see how OKRs were used in more creative environments, exploratory ones, startups, or uh, as well as at large companies, and <laughs> learned from, of course, the great uh, John Doerr, but the person that he learned from, Andy Grove. And so John had all these archive videos, Jim, of Andy Grove teaching OKRs. And so I, I, I learned from the best and what, learn, yeah. <laughs> how did you learn from the best? I, I have a friend uh, uh, who's at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, at the uh, uh, Bloomberg School of uh, Public Health. His name is Dr. George Everly. And uh, a, fr a mutual, uh, a friend of his, uh, a psychiatrist there, accuses uh, George of being the type of person, if he's interested in a subject, he doesn't learn about it, he writes a book about it. You did the same thing. You're not only there with, the people who conceived it and at first put it into practice and were mo modifying it and making it even bigger and better. But then they ask you to write the book about it. That, that, that's such so true. The, the experience of trying to craft the OKRs. First of Jim, it didn't start out as a book. It started out as what OKRs uh, could we craft around the climate crisis, right? And so we came up with a very simple one first. It's like get the 59 billion tons of emissions down to zero. But what are the actual other objectives? And we did what, you know, I think any engineer or investor or truly, you know, how John Doerr loves to work, which is talk to experts, spend time with them, build that network. And so we got to reach out to, I think at the point, there's maybe 20 or 30 people. We would show off our OKRs, get them to critique it. They would add another element to it. We would learn a ton. It was COVID uh, uh, March, you know, 2020. So all these meetings, Jim, shifted to Zoom, just like this. And yep. it was really easy for us to hit the record button. And a good couple of months into the project, we're like, wait, it's kind of unfair that we're hearing all these incredible, inspiring stories from yes. entrepreneurs, policymakers, scientists, and so forth. And so that's when the book project started, Jim, because we're like, well, let's take these OKRs. Yep. Let's explain the depth around them, the science and pieces, and then tell these stories of the people who are working to change it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how speed and scale was was born. And that's where the action plan comes from, right? And the actual you, OKRs that are- You mean this little baby. Yes, that little baby. So you write the book on OKRs, which frankly is becoming a Bible in any company I'm involved with. Thank you, Ryan. Thank but you. then speed and scale. First of all, when I say it's a heavy book, I mean that literally and figuratively. It is one heavy physical book. <laughs> the paper stock you wrote this on- <laughs> is uh i hand it to people i go whoa <laughs> it it definitely feels like a brick the uh, the next in the next print we, we found some lighter paper jim but i think we're also going to be able to put all of our citation and sources online john was very adamant that the book every line would have its citation in the back of where it came from because yeah. i think one challenge in tackling this crisis is there's so much you know folks questioning the facts jim which is unfair Rightfully, everything you write on this topic, you should be rigorous. And so we were. So near half of the book is all the citations for all of the things you're reading. And so if you want to learn more of why something is, you can flip to the back and learn it. So you have two amazing uh, con uh, uh, sequential uh, experiences for you, Ryan, that have uh, continued to help shape who and what you are and what you have in your personal tool bag of skill sets. So having worked with those people, John and uh, and the Intel people on what OKRs were, codify it, make it usable, put it, open it up to everybody, and then of course the book is a byproduct of all that work. What what a way to learn! And when you're learn when you're doing something, knowing that you're going to bring it to others, it, it seems to me that it reformats your brain in terms of how you listen, how you think, how you act. And, okay, how will I teach this to others? Makes you learn differently. And then you had the same assignment just soon after that with speed and scale saying, you obviously realized, wow, uh, while I'm on this path, not being a climatologist 
uh, by training, uh, but now by interest, you say, oh, my God, this problem is real. And these mm-hmm. smart people, uh, John and Bill Gates et al., who were alert to the challenge, you created a set of OKRs for us as uh, uh, members of a, a population of the world uh, of how we could impact it and help craft a movement. But I want to go back to the beginning of that, which is how did you come up with the, the climate OKRs? What yeah. inputs did you have? How are you influencing the public dialogue and performance? The book came out in November of 21. So we're just over a year for the book now. Are there things that you're proud of? Are there things that you're frustrated by? Jim, the, the reaction to the book has been quite incredible. The the my, my most favorite kind of reaction to it has been it's a book of solutions. It's a book that has a plan, right? Of what we're supposed to do. I think there's a lot of climate content and books out there that explain the problem, which is really important. But we wrote a book for people that understood that the problem's there. So now what do I do? It's so the book, the way that we structured it, it's two parts, right? There are two sets of goals. There's the, how do we get to zero, right? The six objectives, electrifying transportation, decarbonizing the grid, fixing our food system, protecting nature, cleaning up industry, and then removing all the stubborn carbon that's left over. We do those. And Jim, we have five, three to five key results attached to each of those to show if we're making progress. Yep. We're going to get to zero, but we've got to get to net zero soon, right? If we let the course of events happen, it may take us 50 to 100 years, sorry, more than that to get there. Mm-hmm. We need to cut emissions in half by 2030 and then all the way by 2050. We have to keep it net zero, but you're right. Depending on how late we are to hit that target, we may have to remove more from the atmosphere than we're emitting. Our friend Lucas said, look, it's hard for us to focus on a lot of things. Let's just focus on carbon particles. It's a yes and. It's I would say carbon and then methane. Methane's a, a kind of a notorious little one that help that sorry it doesn't help. It actually just heats the world just a little bit faster or a lot faster than CO two. Yeah. Um, Jim, the one other part too is the second part of the book is the accelerants, how we get there faster. And these are the things that you can you and I can actually pull on. It's about winning the policy and politics. Right. We need policies passed that set building standards, set and create great grids in the country and so forth. We also then need to turn movements into action. That's everything from voting for people that care about this. Before you turn turn the movement into action. Of course. A big part of that seems to be that what I've learned from you just in the the interactions I've been fortunate enough to have with you is it takes a movement. Totally. And movements can happen in all places. You know, an activist is Greta Thunberg, who goes from one year striking by herself to getting a million students out on the streets, to making climate a top voting issue in Europe. Mm-hmm. Activism also is companies and boards and CEOs saying, we are going to reach net zero by a certain target and actually mobilizing the resources within their companies to get there. You know, the vast majority of emissions have happened in the past 30 years. Our kids and the grandkids, you know, they're the ones that are going to experience the effects of it. And so, There's this urgency now, Jim, of to do the right thing. I would say what's changing now, though, is the right thing often is the better thing, the more performant thing, the profitable thing. And that Mm. would be the biggest change between, you know, when we wrote the book, if we wrote the book just five years ago, Jim, or 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to say a few things. I wouldn't be able to say this. I wouldn't be able to say that solar and wind is now cheaper than oil and gas, right, and coal. I wouldn't be able to say that Beyond Meat and Tesla are incredibly valuable companies. I wouldn't, there's so many more proof points today, Jim, of the thing that we want to see happen, the cleaner, greener thing Mm -hmm. being actually the profitable thing, right? John Doerr has this nice saying when he goes, when the right thing becomes the profitable thing, it becomes the probable thing. And, I love that. <laughs> yeah. and, and what you're seeing and learning, I think the electric vehicle movement is is phenomenal because people are picking electric vehicles, not because they're green, Jim, it's because they're better vehicles. You know, you buy the vehicle, you pay a little more in some cases, and then you, you know, you talk about that it's green, but you're buying that Ford F-150 Lightning because it's a battery that can actually, yep. you can use in the field. You're buying yep. a Tesla because it's 
faster, more performant than, you know, a gas guzzling car. Oh, I, you know, I, exploding I, fossil fuels is very inefficient. Remember the four accelerants, policy politics is one, movements is the other. The other two are innovation and investment. When yep. you think about innovation, it's really about cost, Jim. The, the hard lessons learned from Kleiner and its original clean tech investing is if you're building a new company that's producing a commodity like energy or fuel, you compete only on cost. And that's really a wake-up call. Um, if you compete on other kinds of products, it can be about performance, the things you drive, the things you put on your face, you eat, and so forth. And so people will pay the premium there. But one thing we realized is we are missing the talent needed and the companies needed to help get us between 2030 and beyond. So we have all the technologies that we need, Jim, to cut emissions in half, right? Solar, wind, good storage, electric vehicles, you know, scaling up lithium ion and stuff like that. We have that right in front of us and that'll get us easily halfway there. But the other half, Jim, is hard. Cleaner steel, cleaner concrete, other ways of truly long duration storage that we haven't invented yet. And for that, we're going to need innovators. We're going to need, you know, new policymakers to be trained to pass the right policies. And so a school like the Stanford Door School for Sustainability is a place that can create that. One of my favorite reflections that John has about the school and why Stanford, and it's really that entrepreneurial spirit. You know, when you look at the number of companies that have come out of Stanford, I think it's in the 20,000 plus. But when you look at- Amazing the battery companies that have come out of Stanford, when you look at the employees that are working at, you know, Tesla's and space like X's of the world, when you look at a Sunrun founded by Stanford, like you can see that there is a center of gravity that exists there already. And this here can hopefully catalyze. Um, but like John says too, Jim, there's going to be many climate schools. Uh, this one in particular sets the bar differently because it's not only a school that's bringing the policy and the sciences, you've got engineers and chemists and civil engineers under the same roof as well too. And so it's a very holistic school there to solve problems. What an amazingly audacious step and activity to say, I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I really want to make a difference. I, I applaud John and you and the work you've done there. It's just amazing. And you mentioned how now, five years later, you can say things that weren't true five years ago, like it's now more cost-effective uh, uh, to use and uh, wind and uh, solar. And uh, we had a conversation, I know you know uh, Ken Washington, uh, a friend who used to be the CTO at uh, Ford Motor Company, now running robotics at Amazon. Ken's an amazing guy. I like him a lot. Better than him is his wife, but uh, uh, Angela, who's uh, just a terrific lady. But... Uh, in a conversation with Angela and Ken, I asked Ken, who's a nuclear physicist, I said, if, if you were the czar of energy in the world tomorrow, uh, where, how would you shift our bets? You don't have to go to a committee. Where would you? I thought, sure, Brian, that he would say, I'd go nuclear. Yeah. And he didn't. He didn't. He said, I wouldn't shut down nuclear. I'd keep it yeah. going and keep it the investment there. But everything should be solar now because the economics have just turned in the last few years to make it the way to go. His forecast is that you'll be able to make steel with AI uh, engineered and, and empowered uh, solar energy uh, in the very near future. And that's pretty amazing because steel takes a real high temperature and therefore it emits a great deal of carbon. But if you could switch just one industry like that that's so dependent on mm -hmm. fossil fuels to solar, that would be remarkable. It would be remarkable. I mean, when you take solar and wind and a good storage system and you have it together, you could do anything. Jim, Jim, there's going to be a point in where we're going to have excess moments of excess energy, right? Because of we've deployed so much renewables. This is a future, kind of a beautiful future. And in those moments, you can use those to produce clean hydrogen that goes to powering the furnaces that need to produce steel at its high temperatures. He's right. You know, the, the truth is like, we, we should be keeping all of the nuclear plants we have open. We should be deploying as much solar and wind as we can. We need to start to connect the grid in the U.S., Jim. Like, it's really hard to move energy around. Yeah, it dissipates quite quickly. And there's where science can really help out. Completely. And, you know, we need to then invent things like, you know, new reactors, like fusion reactors, because... 
you know, these are the things that if we, we just had as a society our fusion moment, it, it, it did. There was a there was an incredible moment that uh, the you know to unpack that. What happened was they proved that it was possible, right? That you could create net energy in a lab. You've got to find a way to commercially do it, and that's what companies like Commonwealth Fusion and other are going after. But it shows that you know it's Bernoulli principle proving it was possible. Yes. We still need that Kitty Hawk moment to happen. It, it, exciting! Our kids and grandkids will be much more excited about this. We just sort of oh, that's interesting. Unless you're in the field like you are, but I mean, it, this is something people will write about in history as the moment. Completely, and I think the takeaway you know from what even Ken Washington's like kind of reminder is that we've got to take action now. So just because fusion advancements have happened, just because there are carbon removal technologies that are scaling up in the horizon, we've got to do everything we can to clean up the grid, switch to electric vehicles, and doing just those two very big things, Jim, like would get us to that halfway mark. What role uh, can and should government be playing to uh, influence the margins of where we go, what we do, what we invest in uh, to get us further down the road faster. What's on the outside of the wall of the Stanford Door School of Sustainability in terms of the dials? What are the measurements, your, your OKRs that you're measuring, how we're doing against our goals? Two great questions. So on the government side, um, two things, three things immediately come to mind, right? Every government should be looking at energy security. Energy security 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and any time earlier was about drilling more oil, finding more natural gas. But because of how cheap solar and wind is, and that the fact that you can produce it locally and you don't have to import it, it means that energy security now strategies, Jim, have to be completely about the renewable domestically produced stuff. And that is so exciting. The other piece governments need to be thinking about is these are industries of the future. There is going to be a solar and wind winner. And in many ways, it's already China, in many ways, already Europe for wind. But that doesn't mean that the U.S. can stand, needs to stand by, right? We invented many of these technologies, right? And so we've got to scale those up. But it's also about ensuring that the hydrogen industries of the future, that the electric vehicles, all the different parts and pieces, I'm putting the American hat on, that we win on them, and that these are the jobs and industries and companies that are based here. But if I take off my American hat and put on any other country, Jim, this is a race, a race to be won. And the neat thing is winning here means a cleaner, greener future. Um, the OKRs for the door school, um, what's fun about that is they've got an incredible leadership team there, you know, led by Arun Mujumdar, who is the former RPE director. And mm -hmm. he's been very public about how do we build the best faculty, faculty community, right? Because they're pulling together all these schools and then they get to add 60 more. And so there's, of course, I've got to imagine OKRs around the talent there. Um, but he's so got the this school uh, uh, envisions themselves playing a organizing and leadership role of other schools of climate around the country. Oh, sorry. No, what I meant there was the school itself, Jim, is has pulled... Uh, Okay. Faculty members across Stanford and under one yep. roof and gotcha. it's adding 60 more people, mm -hmm. which means it'll have 800 plus different, you know, grad students and postdocs. And just that kind of center of gravity gets very exciting. It has an accelerator that it wants to lead and, and, and launch, which is focused on flag post flagship targets. Like how do we get hydrogen to this price? How do we get car and there's so much stuff. I would just say it's also, though, in many ways, the first inning, and they're just getting started. And so mm. um, I would say for anybody, watch just like we are eagerly to see the outputs of that. Well, I, I expect a couple of things, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I, I expect the next few years for you will be at least as amazing as the last few. Uh, how lucky am I that I get to hang around with you? We serve on the board of Amherst together, so that gives me an excuse to hang around with people like you and John and John Mello. Uh, just a, a wonderful board, a wonderful company, wonderful set of opportunities in front of them. Uh, anything time I can get more of you uh, personally or how we can, as a, a society, create more of you, we'd all be better for it. It's and I can't wait. I expect that uh, as you get interested in the next subject area, there'll be another book in the next year or two. And I can't wait to read it. 
Oh, you're too kind, Jim. Thank you. And and for anybody listening, if you go to, you know, speedandscale.com, you'll find all, you know, part of this, Jim, is giving, giving, giving. How do we get all this information out there, right? Open source. I mean, that's like actually maybe the best way to call it. This is an open source, open data movement around tackling the climate crisis. And, uh, and I know you're a kindred spirit with Seth Godin and his new book, and he's all about open source too. He wrote his book in a, in yeah, a collaborative uh, uh, kind of way. It's a, a, Oh, you have it right there too? <laughs> oh yeah. And, and because when you were talking about everything is annotated, everything is uh, uh, referenced here, clearly that's what the, our friend Seth Godin did in his book too. And just like you and like John Doerr, he's, he's crossed the chasm in terms of, he said, climate and climate investing is the biggest business opportunity he saw. And he's, he, he said that he's devoting 100% of his energy which is like you, a lot of darn energy toward this effort. So uh, as a person who struggles to keep up with you smart guys, I, I don't need to do the work myself. You've already done it. I'm in. I just need to find out how uh, from you and by reading Speed and Scale, how uh, in our in my family and my own personal life and our business life, we can help join the movement. So thank you for, uh, thank you for fueling. Pardon the- Of course, uh, Jim. Thank you for having me. The movement. And thanks for being so generous with your time. You're an amazing guy, Ryan. I'm happy and proud to know you. Oh, likewise, Jim. Have a wonderful day. And everybody listening, have a wonderful day as well, too. 